with that, let's, let's kind of jump through this first, this first thing. And I, I start everything that I do, at least I try to start everything that I do, with the idea in mind that at the end of the day, lawsuits, litigation are all battles of credibility. So everything that we do, everything through the day that we talk about, if it's, if it's true that lawsuits are not really not, not a whole lot more than battles of credibility, then it's worth considering how every move you make in a case affects credibility, your credibility and the credibility of, of the other side, right? Because he or she with the credibility at the end tends to be, tends to win. So a lot of what we need to do is first and foremost, build and maintain our credibility and then secondarily, do some things that help us affect in a negative way their credibility. So we're going to talk through this next, this first hour or so that we're, that we're doing this. Um, I, want to, I want us to keep credibility in mind. I want us to keep what I'm going to talk about in terms of a mindset for trucking cases, which the short version, the short answer to that is these are big cases and you have to bring, bring your big case mentality and your big case mindset to the case. Even if it is a case where traditionally you might not think that the injury that you're dealing with is quote, big. I mean, a broken arm case, it's a trucking case, can be a seven figure case. It's not as likely to be that high of a case if it's an automobile case, although it can happen, right? A, a, a surgery case, if it's a truck case, can be a lot, can, can be a, a major, major result. Um, Non-surgical neck cases can be big cases if you're, if you're trucking. So if you bring a big mindset to the case, then you're going to get a bigger result uh, than, if you, if you, than if you don't. And so I want to keep that in mind as we go through the day. What's our mindset? I also want to keep in mind that when we, if, if we're bringing our big case mindset, that part of that big case mindset also is going to be to protect your case, to build your case, to not be afraid to spend some money on your case, and those kinds of things along the way. To take the time, to put the amount of time, energy, and focus on that case to make it a big case, right? Treat it as a big case, and other people will treat it as a big case. So it's not the case that you're agreeing to 10 continuances on voluntarily. It's not the case that you're that you're skimping on the expert on those kinds of things. And we'll talk more about that through the day. <coughs> We're also, especially during this first section, I'm going to spend some time talking about what the case needs to be about. And notice the way I say that, right? I'm not saying what the hint should be what the, what the case is really about. Not Generally, it's not going to be what the defense says the case is about. That's their game. What's your game? We're going to talk about how you can move the time frames in your case. And look, instead of looking at the intersection case, how do we back up from the intersection and start to examine the conduct of the truck driver and the motor carrier earlier in time? For, pr probably at a time when your client's not in the picture at all. Right? Back in the time when the company is training their driver, or making decisions about what's going to be part of their driver training program or driver safety program, your client's nowhere in the picture. Hard to, put, hard to point fingers at your client when they're not in the picture at all. So we'll talk about those kinds of things, including um, we'll talk about uh, limiting the number of things that you focus on in a case and some of those kinds of concepts as well as we go through. And by the way, as we go through the day, after I talk about sort of these, this smattering of generalities here, Michael's going to come up and, and, and both talk about and show you and demonstrate a little bit for you some jury selection specific to trucking cases. Um, and then he's going to talk about preparing for and taking key depositions uh, in, in, in the trucking case. And I think we're both doing uh, little parts and pieces of that with you doing the truck driver and me doing a, a safety director or vice versa, I can't remember. And then um, we'll talk some specifics about um, openings and closings in trucking cases. Uh, and then uh, all the way down to at some point during the day, I think when we're talking about depositions, I'm also going to do a short presentation on, on 
on examining police officers, and usually in the context where they're hostile to your case, which is not at all uncommon in, in even some of the best trucking cases we've ever had. They start off with everybody being against you, including law enforcement, right, in the case. So we'll talk about that, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about, at the end of the day, time permitting, which it should, we'll talk about some of the concepts about, um, about putting up cases quicker, um, about how to do that with different ty types of witnesses, including before and after witnesses and the like. So I think that's kind of the agenda for the day. So let's move, getting back into this. Um, so I, I started out saying we're gonna, we're gonna talk for a few minutes about credibility, and I, and, and I like to, to kind of jokingly say, do you wanna know the trick to being viewed as the most credible person in the courtroom? It's, it's really, it's a pretty simple trick. It's not an easy, it's not easy, but it's a simple trick. And the trick is that every morning when you get up, you have to tell yourself, that come hell or high water, I'm going to be the most credible lawyer in whatever room I go into. And then you have to just do that. That's all. That's all you got to do. In other words, there is no damn trick. It's got to be a lifestyle. Credibility, I think, is a lifestyle. And, and so I think we can affect that. You all know lawyers right now, some of whom are on our side and many of whom are on the other side, who you would say, as soon as you hear their name, it does not go with credibility, right? They may be good people, but, they don't, but it doesn't go with credibility. I'm telling you, credibility goes a long way, and, it, and, and, and it's something that I guess, I guess it's important to say, credibility is kind of what you do when nobody's looking, right? Um, it's, it's when you can get away with something, but you don't try to get away with it. Um, and some of you are saying, well, that interferes with my duty of zealous representation. Yeah, I used to use that excuse a lot for me, too. And um, so I, I think, though, it's, it's important. We don't talk enough about this. Being credible means when you make a mistake in a case, you own it. You own it completely. You don't try to do this. You just own it. And a crazy thing happens. You know, I, I, remember, I remember an old time, uh, the so old time um, criminal defense lawyer telling me that uh, from Georgia, his name is Bobby Lee Cook, who's a famous guy. Um, and, he, and, and one time I, I was talking to him after he did a presentation, and he was talking about how juries will forgive just about anything if you're straight up with them. He said, I've, I, I, I've, I've watched murderers walk out of courtrooms because they were credible. And, um, and then, of course, he followed it up with, some folks just need killing, you know? Um, that's it. Which I think, I think served him well during his years as, as, a, as, as a lawyer. But so what I'm commending to you is wherever you are in your career and however you have chosen to live up to this point in time, one of my favorite sayings is, you always have the power to say, this is not the way the story is going to end. And so you can start to do things immediately. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll digress and tell you a real quick story um, about one of my mentors earlier on in my career. I was, I, I, were, I, I guess I was fortunate that I got to start working on big cases pretty much immediately, not because of anything that's good about me, but because of his great lawyers who, who, um, who hired me. And, and that's all they did was work on big cases. So I was working on big cases very early. And so I always had much more experienced lawyers against me. And it was, and my way of dealing with that, being a former police officer, was to be that guy, right? You know, you want to bring it, bring it. And, um, and so one day, I almost got it into a physical fight with a defense lawyer in front of a judge in court. And the judge, um, I don't know if you, you remember uh, Baxter. Oh, it was yeah, pretty Jerry? funny, Jerry Baxter. So, and I, my fight was was going to be with John Hall. We were in, we were spitting at each other, you know, this close to each other, you know. That actually and, doesn't surprise me, but okay. And jo John Hall is kind of very willing to engage in, in in that way. Some of you guys may know him. So Baxter, being Baxter, looked at the um, at the bailiff and he said, uh, he said, uh, send these guys out in the hallway and check on them in ten minutes. Which whoever's standing, I'm ruling in favor of. 
Um, so the next day, I'm sitting in my, in my office, and, and um, Phil Henry, who was my mentor, um, a tall, gentleman lawyer from Atlanta, um, who is always well thought of. I mean, like, the, the, um, just always the high road lawyer. He came in, and he closed my door, and he sat across from my, me, and he said, you know, I heard what happened yesterday in court. I said, yeah. He said, boy, John can be an asshole. <coughs> and I said, yep, he can. And he said, you know, but I've been thinking, um, in this case over here, you got an asshole. I said, oh, yeah, that guy's an asshole. And in this case over here, you got an asshole. Uh, yeah, and in this case over here, you have an asshole. And he said, Joe, you know I love you like a son, but when you have that many assholes in cases, you got to ask yourself who's being the asshole. And then he got up, and he walked out of my office. And I was like looking for the blood, you know, because I felt like I had been stabbed. And I picked up, the, what I did is I picked up the phone and I called John Hall. And I said, um, I take 100% responsibility for what happened yesterday. That's not the kind of lawyer I want to be. And I'm asking you to please forgive me. It won't happen again. And he said, you were an asshole, and, uh, but I'll forgive you. So, um, so that's, my, that's my mea culpa story for, the, for today. But part of being credible is also not being nitpicky. And especially in trucking, there's an opportunity to fail there because there's lots of regulations and there's lots of technicals. And we get so excited as lawyers when we find something and we can say, another violation. And we want to make big charts that are this long of every violation. But sometimes we can cross the line and we can become the nitpicky lawyer. And nitpicky and credibility don't really go together. It's like nitpicky and, I'm, I'm sorry, like get trying to get off on a technicality and credibility don't go together. Another thing that doesn't go together for, for lay people when it comes to credibility is alternative theories. We were all taught in law school to how many pegs can you put on the pegboard or some variation of that, right? And so we, we learn to be very, to feel very okay about alternative theories. Well, if this or this or this. Well, to jurors, I think that is, um, I think they look at that and say, you're a schizophrenic. And I don't mean that to sound flippant. I think it's a schizophrenic thought process, right? There, it's not okay with them. And it doesn't resonate as credible with them. So the point is, uh, if, you can, if, you can, if you can zero in on something, for your case, and you can not be the nitpicky lawyer, you're in a lot better shape. All right, so let's get into some more, more specific stuff. Um, so the mindset piece, real quickly, jumping through, is these, are, these cases are different. And so you're gonna treat them as different from the very first moment. In fact, from before the first moment, when hopefully I can convince you if you don't already have systems in place in your office, to take care of the trucking case and to distinguish the trucking case from other cases that come into your office. If, if, you, if you run more of a volume-based practice, you got to somehow separate out the truck case early. Because if you don't, it's going to be treated like every other car wreck case in your office because that's gonna be the default, because that is the default. It was the default when Michael and I started doing this you know, a long time ago now, 17, 18 years ago. Um, doing, you know, focusing on trucking, and um, and it's still for for most firms, it's still the default. Is the cases get handled as just big car crash cases? Um, so there, it, the cases are different. If you think about the differences, it, it's all the way through. I mean, everything from the vehicles to the way the crash happens, what are called the dynamics in accident reconstruction, the the vehicle data that's available from these things. Uh, the way claims are handled by insurance companies are different. Uh, the, the players are different. We have on top of the typical driver and employer situation, you've got all kinds of other potential players. In the, you've got brokers, you've got shippers, you've got freight forwarders, you've got consigners, you've got maintenance companies that are third-party maintenance companies. Nowadays, you're now starting to have third-party compliance companies that are coming in to do driver qualification and hiring and training and all these other things that, that are starting to happen. So you have all of those different entities have potential liability because we're dealing with a very hyper-regulated environment, right? 
not only is the driver and the motor carrier regulated, but all those types of entities, not all of them, but a lot of them, for freight forwarders, brokers, um, consigners, those are all entities that are regulated under the same Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations as the big trucks are. So all of them have duties and responsibilities. And in cases, which we unfortunately have frequently, where you have an injury that's bigger than the insurance coverage that's available on the first most obviously at fault party, now we have to look at all these other entities to find coverage. And so um, it's what, what the way, I mean, for the purposes of today, what, I, what I'd like for you to carry with you out of here is the idea that if you've got a case where the damages warrant it and you don't have enough coverage, that's when, if you, that's when it's time to dig in because there are, there, there, there are lots of ways that you may be leaving, leaving insurance money on the table. Like for, I'll give you an example. Um, how many people in here, before I say it, know that the chassis that are used at ports that they put, that they will attach a freight container to, literally pin it to, and then it drives down the road. Those chassis are typically part of something called a chassis interchange agreement because they're, imagine how much it would cost if you had to move your own chassis from yard to yard all the time. So there's pools of these and and how many people here knew before now that those comp those interchange um, entities typically have between 50 and 150 million dollars in coverage, and that you can get to that coverage if you have you you don't it, there there doesn't have to be anything wrong with the chassis, it just needs to be attached to a motor carrier in transit at the time of a crash. That's it. So you're not you don't have to make a product liability case, you don't have to make an owner's negligence case. It's just an insurance policy that attaches by operation of law to your case. But if you didn't know to look for it, and I'll tell you, a lot of, I think a lot of defense lawyers don't know to look for it. Some of them know exactly what to look for, and they choose to not reveal things. But a lot of them, I don't think they know that. Uh, and so they don't put people on notice, and you dot, 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 and go. So the point, the point is, there's lots of different places to look for coverage. There's ways to get coverage to apply in trucking cases where in situations where, where there would be an, a, a proper defense um, if it were not a non-trucking case. For instance, some policies have things like listed auto uh, ex exceptions, and they have listed driver ex um, uh, provisions in the contract. They have certain notice provisions in the contract. Um, if, they get, if those were to get violated, if it was a regular auto wreck case or a premises liability case, the insurance company would just file a deck action and say coverage is, is denied, right? It, in, in trucking cases, there's a surety that attaches to every commercial policy. It's called an MCS 90 endorsement, and it applies, and it, it literally says that, um, that those types of defenses like the ones I mentioned, listed auto, listed driver, those types of defenses are ineffective against the surety. So what happens is, the, um, the way it works is that the, um, the, uh, you, you collect $750,000, that's the limit, doesn't matter what the policy was, you, you can collect $750,000, it's, it's available to you, and then the insurance company has a right to go back against the insured to try to collect their money back, which, is not our problem, that's now their problem. And I like that being their problem because if you've ever tried to go get direct money out of a, out of a defendant, it's not easy to do, right? So especially, it's especially true in, in the transportation world. So, um, you know, the, 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 you know the, the purpose of this first piece here is just to set the idea for us for today, but also for you in all of your cases that these cases are really different. That's not just some marketing slogan. And so if they're really different, and look, I go on and say the documents that are, that are, that are um, important in these cases are different because of all the compliance, all the rules and regulations that, that you have the opportunity to, um, to utilize for your case. But there's another ugly deep part, uh, ugly deep, ugly part of our 
of, of how, why these cases are different also. It's a much more sophisticated running world, right? All of you know in your community, probably, there's some lawyer or set of lawyers who are breaking the rules of ethics, right? They're soliciting cases in an improper way. And um, you know, I've, I've lost big cases that way. And I'm, I'm known for being pretty good at this. Um, and so if I can lose them, anybody in here can lose them. And you lose them to people who will sell somebody a bill of goods. They'll, they'll give them money. They'll do, and, and they'll do anything. They'll sneak into the, into the, uh, um, into the hospital room. They have deals with doctors, and you all, I'm not, I, I mean, I don't, you guys don't need me to preach on this, but I'm, I'm preaching on it only to say to you, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to get one of these cases, you need to treat it different, including how you protect it. It, it needs to be treated in your office as, as a gem case, because people are after it. People are after it after you have it signed up, not just before you have it signed up. People are cons will, will stay after it. And so you have to, so how do you combat that? The only thing I can tell you is treat it as important and make sure the client knows how, that, you're, that you're treating it as important. So it's extra attention to the client. It's making sure the client knows that you, you hired experts. Uh, you already, you're, you're all over this thing. It's, it's reminding them, it's frankly, it's filing the case early that protects you and the, and, and the, and the integrity of the case. Um, there's lots of reasons to file these cases early, but that's one of them, unfortunately, uh, that, that is true. And so it's not to be forgotten, and it needs to be part of your intake system. It needs to be thought through. So how are you going to, because everybody in here gets busy, right? And all the great intentions go you know, out the window. So who's going to back you up and make sure, maybe it's a paralegal in your office, maybe it's your law partner, maybe it's an associate, maybe it's whoever, but somebody needs to be assigned to make sure that you don't lose that case. That's your assignment. Do whatever the hell you need to do to not lose the case, okay? And that hopefully that's gonna mean extra attention where you're showing them, you're showing the client. It also, by the way, is going to have the added benefit of making you work harder on the case because you have to, you're gonna have to give the client more frequent updates, which is gonna inert, it's going to inert to your benefit when it comes to you know getting the case prepared anyway, and the impression that the other side has of how important the case is to to you, if you don't think that that sets helps set value in a case, I think you're missing I think you're missing something that's right in front of you, All right? So you treat the case as big, et cetera, et cetera. So we're saying treat it differently. So I want to just I'm just throwing this up. This is not you know they, if they told you we're not doing math today, I don't want to violate that. But I just want to show you this real quick thing, just to help demonstrate for you that these case, how different these cases are. You know, in accident reconstruction, we talk about there's, there's a concept of momentum. You guys probably have all heard about this to some degree, right? So let's just see what happens because of this mass differential between you know, a fully loaded tractor trailer at 80,000 pounds and your typical car weighing somewhere around 4,000 pounds. There's a 20 to one ratio there in terms, of, in terms of mass. Why does that matter, okay? Here's why it matters. How fast does a car need to go to have the same amount of momentum that a truck has that's going five miles an hour? And the bottom line is because, because of that mass ratio, 20 to one mass ratio, the answer is 100 miles an hour. 100 miles an hour. Now, don't make the mistake of saying momentum equals injury producing force. That's not exactly true. So I don't want you walking out of here and saying the wreck's gonna have the same injury producing force as a, as, a, as a 100 mile an hour wreck. But from a momentum perspective, this is true. This dramatically changes the dynamics of what happens in a crash. So the mass differential is a huge, huge thing. So I just threw this up just, just, to, just to, to show you, okay? Here's another, here's why, another reason why it's important. Okay, so in a car-to-car -car situation, let, so let's say they're both, they're both 4,000 pounds, same mass, right? One of them's going zero miles an hour, one of them's going 10 miles an hour. So the 10 mile an hour car hits the zero mile an hour car, what happens? 10 mile an hour car reduce it, its force, 
that it brings with it goes into the zero mile an hour car. It accelerates the zero mile an hour car to what? Five miles an hour it, because they're equal. And it's all because of the mass differential. Uh, so you have, you have each vehicle experiencing a five mile an hour delta V change in velocity. I promise I'm not going to get more, I'm not going to jump into active reconstruction deeply, but I want you to understand the difference between that, five mile an hour differential versus if we now go to the 80,000 pound truck, I should have used in the other example, 20 miles an hour instead of 10. So what would happen in 20 miles an hour? It becomes the, the, the bullet car goes down to 10, the, the, um, the target car goes up to 10, from zero, the target car experiences a, an acceleration of a change in velocity of 10 miles an hour. So think about what energy that has and maybe what injury that can produce. Um, and the other vehicle slows down in, a, in the same period of time, slows down to, um, to 10 miles an hour from 20. Now here's the truck. Because of the mass ratio, what happens is the truck hits the car, the car goes from zero miles an hour all the way up to 19 miles per hour. So you only slows the truck down by a mile an hour. Okay, so I mean we could do, I could show you all the math on this, but it really comes down to very, very basic and it comes down to these mass differential, these ratios, mass ratios. So the point here is, it's a very, very big difference to go from, from um, to get to 10 miles an hour, you're, you're literally doubling the amount of change in velocity in the car, and change in velocity is what is, what is the injury producing forces. That is the injury producing force, the change in velocity. And so what happens here, it also happens dramatically faster. So you have, if you think about it, when all of us landed here in Vegas, you experienced a 250 mile an hour impact with the ground. But you experienced it over seven seconds and a little bit more than a quarter of a mile runway. So you didn't hurt, you didn't get hurt in the process. That same delta V of 250 miles an hour into the side of a mountain, we're all dead, right? So it has to do with both the force and the amount of time. So I'm just throwing this up not to get sophisticated, but just from the beginning to be able to show there's mathematical reasons why these cases are dramatically different, okay? There's has to do with, with mismatched heights, of bumpers, and the like. So. The other piece of mindset that I want to talk about before I move forward from here is an us versus them mindset. And what I mean by that is there's the trucking world and then there's the rest of us. Now this doesn't obviously apply or can't apply if you have a truck on truck situation. But a lot of what we're doing here and what needs to be sort of the mindset is there's, we, we are able to point a finger at truck and say, the rules are different for you, the this is different for you, the what you're supposed to do to be safe is different for you. Why? Because of things like these mass differentials, because of the added, issue, the added, the added responsibilities that you should have because you're driving something that has a 20 to one mass ratio. It's not just we're picking on you, right? But we are gonna, sometimes we're able to say, we're, we're able to say, Truck drivers should be responsible vis-a-vis -a, -vis a car driver even if they did the same damn thing wrong because that's how different these things are. I hope that makes sense um, to you. But at the end of the day, what, what we're saying throughout these cases, throughout the deposition prep, throughout the what's the case need to be about, throughout the actual, I mean, even the presentation of, the, of, of things at trial, is we are, we are painting, um, we're painting this us versus them world. If this is my jury right here, you're part of us because I'm not gonna have a CDL driver probably on the jury, not necessarily because I wouldn't keep one because it would be kind of interesting to think about potentially keeping one on there if it was all about rule violations and they were clear, but I'd be a little worried about that. So.